Born on April 20th, 1889, Adolf Hitler was almost named Adolf Hitler, or Adolf Schickelgruber, a couple of not-so-intimidating names. His father, Alois, had taken the surname Schickelgruber, which he decided to change to Hitler. However, on the documents, the name was changed to Alois Hitler. Adolf was born during his father's third marriage to Clara Polzil in Austria-Hungary, close to the German border. Like the youth from that region, Adolf developed a disdain for the Habsburgs and gave in to the German nationalist ideas. Hitler applied for the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna and was rejected, twice. However, he quickly grew fond of Vienna, where he was exposed to fascinating new ideas. His nationalist ideology began to refine its foundations in the big city as Eastern European Jews continued to pour in. He also developed a taste for Wagner operas, whose tainted anti-Semitic legacy was further maligned by serving as the soundtrack for the Nazis' rise. When the First World War started, Hitler moved to Munich. He joined the Bavarian army and served in the First World War. Although he was not fond of the Habsburgs, he participated in significant battles and was wounded in the Battle of the Somme. For his services in the army, Hitler was awarded the Iron Cross First Class Medal that would be found on his dead body within his death chamber, the bunker. While anti-Semitic sentiment skyrocketed with the stabbed-in-the-back rhetoric after the First World War, most accounts claim that Hitler had strict views on the mixing of races well before that. In Mein Kampf, Hitler claims to have developed an appetite for anti-Semitism in Vienna. But a fascinating contradiction is at play here. Just as Wagner met and socialized with Jews, Hitler did the same during his time in Vienna. In the Weimar Republic, Hitler became the Nationalist Socialist German Workers' Party leader, also known as NSDAP, or the Nazi Party. His oratory prowess saw him become a man of stature that people revered. In the earlier years, the Nazi Party had a relatively diverse workforce – capitalists, socialists, and revolutionaries. However, Hitler's hatred for the socialist elements that stabbed Germany in the back was profound. So, he set out to purge these elements from the party turning it into a strictly right-wing organization. The NSDAP often ran into issues with including the word socialist in its name, but the term appealed to the working class, so it was crucial for attracting impressionistic minds. Despite common misconceptions, the Nazi party rose to prominence because it was antithetic to the Marxist Eastern European Jewish elements that had infiltrated Western Europe. Hitler also promulgated a disregard for liberal democracy and free market capitalism, that Western Europe offered. He wanted a clear hierarchy, and to achieve this task, he introduced the idea of the Führer, or ultimate leader, in the early 1920s. Führer allowed him to propagate the idea of supreme authority, almost mythical and supernatural in its ability. Josef Goebbels, the propaganda minister of the NSDAP, exponentially accelerated the populist myth in the late 1920s and onward. Hitler attempted a coup in 1923, remembered as the Beer Hall Putsch, but was put on trial, served nine months in jail, and skyrocketed in popularity. As the German economy witnessed a downturn later in the decade, influential parties, fearing a communist regime, turned to the Nazis. The Nazis gained public support as Hitler's qualms about the Treaty of Versailles began to appease the disgruntled masses. The lower legislative house of the Weimar Republic, the Reichstag, had a majority of Nazis in the early 1930s, with their newfound influence, the Nazis began eliminating political opposition on all sides. In 1932, Paul von Hindenburg was elected president, and despite his dislike for Nazi ideologies, he had to make compromises. In February 1933, a communist, van der Lubbe, was suspected of burning down the Reichstag. As a remedy, von Hindenburg curtailed civilian liberties, allowing the Nazis to wipe out communist opposition thus eliminating a major political force. The public response to the Nazi infiltration of the ranks was confusing and suspenseful. On March 21, 1933, Goebbels came up with a master plan. He arranged for Hitler to meet with a newly elected premier, von Hindenburg, during the official ceremony for the opening of the Reichstag. Hitler bowed down in front of Hindenburg and shook his hand. This public relations stunt calmed the nation and gave the political stakeholders a sense of false security. Two days later, Hitler put forth an enabling act, which would transfer the constitutional powers of the Reichstag to him. 
The Nazis needed 31 extra votes for the bill to pass, and they got them through intimidation. Nazi soldiers took over the Reichstag during the voting and forced everyone to subjugate to the will of Adolf. The Enabling Act marked the end of liberal democracy in Germany, and a new era began, the age of the Third Reich. Using a state of emergency, the Nazis began their witch hunt for the undesirables or foreign elements. They eradicated opposition on every level, political, bureaucratic, and social. Trade unions were eliminated, and labor was united under the banner of the German Labor Front to avoid any potential communist uprisings. Individuals who did not sympathize with the Nazi cause were thrown into old barracks, turning them into large prisons. The Nazis took over state institutions, and Hitler banned all other political parties. Everything was centralized under the iron fist of Nazi forces. People were rushing to join the Nazi party. Germany had been under extreme sanctions after the First World War, and the prospect of a revolution attracted the crowds. Once Hitler took over, the revolution evolved from a possibility to a reality, exciting people even more. Another factor for the Nazi party's exponentially growing popularity was the lack of diversity in socio-political circles. Since the Nazis had eliminated most, if not all, opposition, the road to social and financial prosperity went through them. The applications for SA, or Sturmabteilung, the Nazi party militia, were through the roof, as did applications for SS, or the Schutzstaffel, the Führer's bodyguards. While the Nazi party's membership had been closed mid-year, the two militias' application process continued. However, Heinrich Himmler, appointed head of the SS in 1929, threw out the newer applications the following year. The head of the SA, Ernst Röhm, wanted Hitler to order the takeover of the German army. By centralizing the army under the SA, the SA's powers and, consequently, the Nazis' influence would grow. Despite being an ideological man, Hitler was a realist. He knew that annoying the army would not yield good results. He could not appease the SA by centralizing the military and could not find any excuse to prolong the issue, so he ordered the execution of several SA members. The SS, Hitler's troops, carried out the job, killing almost 400 SA units, including Ernst Röhm. Hitler always resorted to violence in crucial moments, but the destruction of the SA came as a surprise. The sheer impact of a party's militia being wiped out was jarring to the German intelligentsia. At this point, Germany witnessed a significant brain drain as scholars, thinkers, and scientists began leaving the country and settling in other countries around Europe. A few big names to leave Germany during this time include Albert Einstein, Thomas Mann, Fritz Lang, Walter Gropius, and Marlena Dietrich. Meanwhile, some artists came out in support of the Nazi party and kept working in Germany in the coming years. As the SS became increasingly powerful, it became harder to stand against them. Most people resorted to hailing the Fuhrer to stave off a death sentence. The SS had been formed in 1925 with eight individuals, but had grown over the years to increase its members. Hitler had banned them from engaging in political matters, keeping them out of the spotlight, and the soldiers had taken oaths of unwavering loyalty to the Fuhrer. Since Hitler believed in the concept of a master race, or Aryans, he looked for an ardent anti-Semite, which he found in the form of Himmler, to lead the unit. After wiping out the SA, the SS evolved into an elite institution under the tutelage of Himmler. By 1933, the SS had grown to include two subdivisions, the SSVT and the Totenkopfverbande, and there were almost 50,000 troops in the entire SS establishment. The black-clad soldiers with swastikas invoked fear like nothing else. While the SS imposed a code of conduct upon German civilians, they also had to uphold it. A concentration camp was established for SS soldiers who had failed to carry out their duties diligently. In 1934, Himmler became the head of the Gestapo, the secret police responsible for carrying out the most horrifying acts of the Holocaust. Hitler's cult of personality was always on the rise, and by enforcing a regimen of dread among the civilians, he further enabled his fanatic followers. The Aryan ideology encouraged unmatched confidence in their superiority, allowing German troops to fight for their birthright. In times of populist movements, the ability of critical analysis often falls by the wayside. For example, let us consider the symbol Hitler chose to represent his regime, the swastika. The swastika had been found all over the ancient world, from India to Greece. It was even used in the Rig Veda, the ancient Indian manuscript. 
The symbol had a diverse history, which Hitler systematically exploited to usurp it for the superior Nazis. While fear tactics worked very well for Hitler in the first few years, things began to turn when he decided to head east. The winter did not fare well for the underprepared Germans, who lost time, resources, and men in an unrealistic bid to take on the Soviets. As the Soviets slowed the Germans, the German troops could not be relocated to other parts of Europe. The pressure from the West started to gain momentum. With forces closing in from every side, the Germans failed to hold their lines. The Russians finally arrived in Berlin to find Hitler's corpse in his bunker. Some historians have claimed that Hitler exploited national unrest to personal ends. Others have argued that unstable situations, like that of post-World War I Germany, enabled demagogues to take power in the first place. Were the signatories of the humiliating Treaty of Versailles complicit in the horror that followed? That is a separate, lengthy discussion. But using the treaty as an apology for the Nazis' actions would be ludicrous. A look at Hitler's rise to power reveals a pattern of violence and manipulation. Unlike a sincere conviction toward freedom, this behavior comes from reprehensible malevolence. Ever since the conclusion of the First World War, Hitler held a disdain for foreigners who arrived from the East. He is reported to have foretold the loss of Austria-Hungary in the First World War because their armies were made up of mixed races. So while the Treaty of Versailles pushed the Germans into a corner, Hitler was a fascist way before that. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history? Impress your friends and predict the future more accurately based on past events. If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about Adolf Hitler, check out our book, Adolf Hitler, A Captivating Guide to the Life of the Fuhrer of Nazi Germany, the Second World War. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.